Well, good morning. I want your Bibles open, please, to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I am doing this morning a requested lesson, and so I appreciate every request that I get. If you have a sermon thought or a question, or if you have like Bible questions, I can do a question and answer. I've actually thought about doing that. We used to keep a box back there for people to drop Q&A in, and we can do that too. But uh, I always appreciate when someone asked me to do a specific lesson because that lets me know that we're thinking together. Uh, it matters. Th- these lessons matter. And uh, so please feel free to approach me and, and ask for a specific sermon. Let's talk about forgiveness. There are two levels <clears throat> of forgiveness. There is human to human forgiveness. We all need that. We all do things and say things that hurt or offend others. And we need to be willing to ask for forgiveness and be forgiving. But there's also the divine forgiveness, the forgiveness that can only come from God. And I'll start by saying, and I'll finish the lesson by saying, you and I cannot do more than God. We can't forgive more than God forgives. And we cannot forgive in a way that God does not forgive. And so I, I, I think we'll kind of venture through those ideas a little bit this morning because the way I've seen this play out, and perhaps you have too, it's like we're able to forgive more and in a better way than God does as revealed in Scripture. And that's not, well, that's not a good mentality to have, but we need to know this subject. So I hope you'll follow along with me. The word itself means, as used in Scripture, to send forth or away, to let go from oneself. That's just by technical definition what the term forgiveness or forgive means. And you and I are all on common ground here. As Solomon in his prayer of dedication for the temple said in 1 Kings 8 and verse 46, there is no man who does not sin. That was true, what, 3,000 years ago when Solomon was walking the earth. It's true for us today. There is not one of us who does not sin. As such, there's not one of us who does not need forgiveness. Again, human to human or divine to human. But let's talk about this word sin. What does that mean? It means to to err, to miss the mark, or to go wrong. Having your feelings hurt doesn't mean that someone has sinned against you. Someone saying something that you do not like or that you find offensive personally does not mean that they have sinned against you. See, our world has changed this thought so much that if you do or say anything that, that um, crosses the threshold of my personal opinions, then you've sinned against me. We need, to, we need to go back to the Bible and see what the Bible says what sin is. Now, we can certainly be offensive and hurtful to people, and we can, people can actually intend to be that way, and those people need forgiveness. But we need to understand what sin is because that's that's how this particular discussion is framed here in Matthew chapter 18 where your Bible should be open. So here's what I want to do. I want to break down Matthew 18 into six points and then we're going to break it down into more points talking about the subject of forgiveness because this entire chapter, excluding the two questions, there's a question in Matthew 18, 1, who's the greatest in the kingdom? And then you have Peter's question in Matthew 18, 21 is, How often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Everything else, the other 33 verses in Matthew 18, involves Jesus' teaching on this particular subject. So let's break the text down and then we'll get into our main points. Number one is about conversion. Matthew 18, 1 through 5. If you want to see the kingdom of God, you need to become like a little child. You need to be converted. That word conversion. We, We often hear that, obviously, in a religious discussion well, so-and-so converted to this particular religion, or uh, we need to convert more people in our community. What does that word mean? Well, the word, again, by definition, simply means to turn again. That's what the word means here. So look at Matthew chapter 18. Uh, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He sets a child in the midst of them. Unless you be converted, unless you turn again, or you've got to change the way you're thinking. That's the idea here. And become as this little child, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So the first five verses are about what it means to become a member of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, as it says there. 
Verses 6 through 9 of Matthew 18 is a warning. You don't, so he brings this child in to, to the discussion to illustrate his point. You become like this. But then he warns his listeners, if you offend one of these little ones, and the, the same thing is said in what Jeremy read there in Luke chapter 17. Look at verse 6. If you were to offend one of these little ones, or literally sin against them, it would be better for you if a millstone were hung about your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. Look at verse 7. Woe unto the world because of offenses. The King James says, For it must needs be that offenses come. In other words, this is a part of our human experience. You are going to be offended, aren't you, in this world? You're going to see things, you're going to hear things that are going to bother your particular sensitivities. And every one of us is different. Every one of us has a different conscience in the sense of we may tolerate certain things or certain behaviors more. Now, that can be good or that can be bad, but we're all different in that way. All right, so offenses are going to come. But here's the warning. Woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. It's kind of like what Paul says in Romans 12, 18. Uh, as much as, if it is possible, as much as lies in you, be at peace with all men. Sometimes that's not possible. And in this particular context, there are people who are just offensive, sometimes intentionally. I've offended people unintentionally. You've offended people unintentionally, maybe by something I've said or you've said or done or not done. We've all done this kind of thing. But this is a warning. You need to be careful that you don't offend people intentionally. And so, if your hand or your foot offend you, cut it off. If that's the source of your trouble, whatever it is, you need to get rid of it. And obviously, he's not talking about self-mutilation. He's talking about self-control. So Matthew 18, 6 through 9 is a warning. Matthew 18, verses 10 through 14 is an illustration of his point, particularly on the, these offenses. And he illustrates it like this. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, he leaves the 99 that are safe, he goes out to find the one that's lost. Well, we need to seek those who are straying. If I'm the one who's caused them to stray, I have an obligation. If you're the one who's caused a person to stray through an offense, you have an obligation to that person. Again, Mutual obligation here, but it's illustrated by this account of the lost sheep. So let's say a sin. Again, we're not talking about hurt feelings. So the Proverbs say it like this. Um, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You've had this experience, per perhaps. I've had this, surely, and hopefully you've had this experience. I know that I have. Someone that I'm close to or someone you're close to, they approach you and say, hey, listen, you said this to this person or around this person and they heard you and that really hurt them. You need to go to them and you need to apologize. You need to make it right. I know it wasn't intentional, but, but you need to go make that situation right. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. A friend will do that kind of thing for you. A friend will confront you. Someone who cares about you will confront you when something like that has happened. But there is also this teaching in Scripture, not, again, not just about having my feelings hurt. Because, as I've already said, just having your feelings hurt doesn't mean that someone has sinned against you. We need to get that because our culture is so soft. Um, and it's like almost some folks are looking to be offended, aren't they? That's what they live for. Okay, Matthew 18, 15, if your brother trespass against thee, go... And this is how it seems, the way some things go sometimes, this is how this verse seems to read. If your brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell it to some other people and see what their opinion on the situation is first. Go and tell it to some people that you're close to to get them on your side and to hold a grudge against this person. That appears to me sometimes as what people think this verse says. Because isn't it easier to go someone that you're closer to, maybe who hasn't offended you, and say, hey, so-and-so did this and said, listen, guys, I've done this. 
We've all done this. And we're not doing what's right. If your brother trespasses against you, if he crosses the line with you, what does the Scripture say do? Well, you go to him and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. So there's this process of reconciliation in this discussion. And it goes down through verse 20. And then you have verses 21 to 35, which is a practical application. And that's where we're going to, that's where we're going to spend the majority of our uh, lesson this morning. But I want you to notice something here also in Matthew 18. Look beginning in verse 19. I want to dispel with an idea that some people have here. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father who is in heaven. Now, what in the world is he saying here? Well, he's, what he is saying is not independent of what he's just said in verses 15 through 18. If there's a fence, you go alone. If this person doesn't hear you, take two or three. If that person doesn't hear you, you take it before the church and you let them be unto you as a heathen and a publican. That's what verse 19 is saying here. If, if you agree on this, if you've done what I've told you to do, whatever you ask of the Father, if there's reconciliation, if there's not reconciliation, because isn't that where verse 18 ends? Uh, or verse 17, rather? A neglect to hear? So if you've done everything you're supposed to do, I'm with you, and, and God is, essentially, God is on your side. And, and verse 19, verse 20 goes even further. For where two or three, or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. What am I going to dispel with? Matthew 18 and verse 20 that I just read to you has nothing to do with worship. Has nothing to do with worship. I cannot tell you how many times over the years I've heard people say, well, I, I don't need a church because my family and I will just worship together. We're going to stop coming to the church building. We're just going to worship together. And you guys do your thing at the church and we'll do our thing at the house. That is not what Matthew 18 and verse 20 is talking about. This is talking about reconciliation between offended parties. That's what he's talking about. We don't have permission to split up the congregation because we don't like something or whatever the case may be, or like someone. Sometimes that happens. Matthew 18, 20 has nothing to do with worship. But let's think about now the practical application of Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. And it's Jesus' application, so it's the best. I want to start at the very end, though. Look at verse 35 of Matthew 18. Very last verse of this particular text. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. So the foundational truth here of everything we're about to say is this is a requirement. If you want to be right with God, if you want to have the ability to be forgiven by God, you have to be forgiving. Isn't that what the text says? Those are the words of Jesus. All right, so let's break down the text here. When offenses come, when a person sins against another person, number one, that requires a confrontation. And the fact of the matter is, people don't like confrontation, typically speaking. Some do, but you know the feeling of a confrontation. I know the feeling of a confrontation. You get a little nervous. Perhaps you... Uh, you get, as we say, butterflies in your stomach. It's not a good feeling. It's not something that's enjoyable when there's a sin that's been committed and you have to confront a person about that particular situation. In fact, I want to show you this. Look at Matthew 18 and verse 15. We have to define our terms properly. Moreover, if thy brother shall, the King James says, trespass against thee. If you're looking at a New King James Version, it says, Moreover, if thy brother sins against you. They have two different English words, but it's the same Greek word. Uh, and it's, it's the idea of missing the mark. We defined it in the first slide. To sin means to miss the mark, to, to depart from the right way, to err. So again, we're not talking about, we're not talking about simple misunderstandings. We're not talking about something that, that I don't prefer or something that I don't like. This is about sin. And we need to be able to, to differentiate between 
hey, I don't like this, versus this is a violation of the will of God. Because when we start putting our personal preferences over here in this category with, well, that's, that's a sin, and that kind of thing happens, by the way, we put ourselves in the seat of God. And so we can't do that. Well, we can, but we shouldn't do that. We have to understand what we're talking about specifically here when we're talking about forgiveness. It requires a confrontation. What is the solution for sin? Let me ask you that question. If, a, if you have committed a sin, what's the solution? Is it time? Well, I'll just give it a few weeks. I'll give it a few months. And I'm not going to do anything or say anything. I'm just going to let it slide. If a sin has been committed, that is not the solution. Sin is not forgiven. It's not remitted with time. And I think, I think many times we think, and we, I'm just speaking in general terms here, that maybe they'll forget, <clears throat> maybe they'll forget about it. <clears throat> maybe they'll get over it, whatever the case may be. But time, the passage of time is not a remedy. It's not a, a solution for the problem of sin. There has to be a confrontation is what Jesus said. And, you know, typically we hear that word confrontation. That sounds very negative, doesn't it? You've got to confront the person. And the way Jesus presents this, and you've heard me say this before, he does it in Matthew 5, and he does, does it in Matthew chapter 18. Here in Matthew chapter 5, I'm the one who's offended. Matthew 18, I'm the one who's offended. In Matthew chapter 5, I'm the one who's done the offending. But if you've ever sat down and read both of those passages together, it's Matthew 5, I think it's verses 23 to 26, and then Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Whether you are offended because someone has sinned against you, or you are the offender because you sinned against someone else, in both passages, you're the one who's supposed to go. And that's not a contradiction. It's a responsibility that each individual has. You know, someone might sin against me unintentionally. Sit down sometime and read the book of Leviticus. That's, that's a challenging read at times. But find this word unintentional sin or this phrase and see how many times it occurs. That can happen. Not out of any malicious intent, but unintentionally. So if I'm offended or I'm the offender, I have the obligation to go. That's what the biblical text says. There has to be a confrontation in order for there to be forgiveness because that's our ultimate point, forgiveness. Number two, or actually number three, this requires specificity. You have to be specific. Again, if you're in Matthew 18, you are the offended one. Someone has sinned against you. So look at the text, Matthew 18, 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault. You have to specify what was done. You did this. You sinned against me. You said this, you sinned against me. But you still, the process is still, you tell them their fault. First step is alone, right? Second step is, if they don't hear, if they're not willing to repent of their sin, which we're going to get to a little bit later, <clears throat> take one or two with you. And if they don't repent of their sin, you take it before the church. You take it before the assembly. This requires specificity. It's easier to be general, and it's, e it's so easy to try to be nice and not, well, number one, not single anybody out, because again, in our culture, that's just the wrong thing to do. You don't do anything like that. You certainly don't do it publicly. Now, again, if you're familiar with the Bible, you know that that's not, that's not the way God ha would have it to be done. Uh, to me, one perfect one of, among many perfect examples of this is Peter and Paul. Paul withstood Peter to the face before everybody because he was being a hypocrite. You know, it, a situation may, may rise to that occasion. You don't ever want that to have to happen, but this is part of scriptural teaching for forgiveness to be taken place. So if I've offended you or you've offended me, whatever, you, you still have an obligation, and it requires being specific about what has happened. While it requires specificity, it also requires an acknowledgement. Look again at Matthew 18 and verse 15. 
you tell him his fault between thee and him alone, if he shall hear thee. That means, you know what? You're right. I'm the offended party. I come to you. Your obligation, if we're going to reconcile, is not to become defensive and do a, what's called a whataboutism. Well, what about what, about what you... What, yeah, I know you're not perfect, you know, blame shifting, changing the subject, deflecting. It requires a person being specific who's been offended, but it requires also the offender to say, you know what, I hear what you're, I, you're right. And if he hears you, what's happened? You've gained your brother. And then you know what happens? Nothing. It's done. In order to have forgiveness... There has to be an acknowledgement that a sin has been committed. Psalm 32. Write these down if you want to read them later. Read Psalm 32. Read Psalm 51. David, in both of those passages, and it's talking about the same scenario, talks about his acknowledgement of sin. You're right. I did this, and I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have said this. Whatever the case, whatever's happened, it requires an acknowledgement by the offender. Because if there is no acknowledgement, there can't be any repentance. The next thing that I see in the text is that it requires patience and compassion. Now this moves on in the text to Peter's question. Look at uh, Matthew 18, 21. How often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Is there a limit here, Lord? Is the idea. Well, Jesus starts teaching. I say not unto thee until seven times but until 70 times 7. Now, you know what hyperbole is. Hyperbole is an exaggeration to make a point. It's, it's an exaggeration to emphasize something. Jesus isn't saying that the numerical limit of forgiveness is 490 times. Now, once they hit 491, you know, it's all over with. That's not what he's doing here. It's how you do it. And in fact, that's where the text again ended there in Matthew 18 and verse 35 if ye from your hearts, that's the 70 times 7. That's what that means. It's not a literal number here. But it requires patience and compassion. So he illustrates this beginning in verse 23 about a man who was, or a king rather, who was taking account of his servants. And he found a servant who had a massive debt that there was no way he could ever pay back. There was no way. Verse 26, the servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And here's our point. The Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him. Three things there, compassion, let him go, he, he had a hold of him, and forgave him. He sent away this debt that this man owed, he forgave. Well, this servant goes out, verse 28, he finds a fellow servant. He's just dealt with the king, and the king forgave him. But he finds now somebody on his own plane who owes him a very small amount of money, very small debt. Verse 29, that guy has the same request that he had just made of the king. Have patience with me. I'll give you everything I owe. He would not, verse 30, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, You wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou, the King James says, desiredst, desiredst me. You begged me for that forgiveness and I gave it to you. Should not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant? even as I had pity on thee? The illustration here ultimately is of a man asking God's forgiveness and God granting that forgiveness. And then you and me, you and I get into a sinful situation as laid out in verses 15 through 18. God's forgiven me, but I won't forgive you because, well, because I can have power over you now. If there's going to be forgiveness and this, again, this is between human and divine, and this is between human and human. There has to be patience and compassion. We all need forgiveness. Every one of us needs this. But then, look at this. For there to be forgiveness, there has to be honesty. Look at verses 32 and 
33 again. When you asked me, I forgave all the debt. You should have done the same thing. And the one speaking here again is representative of God. It's this king. You should have had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee. Well, then there were consequences for him not being patient and compassionate and pitiful like his master was. None of us are perfect. We do and say things that we shouldn't. We fail to do things that we should. We sin against each other. We are human. But if we want to be forgiven one for another, one of another, and by the way, if we're not right with one another, we can't be right with God. It's not possible. In, these, in, in terms of, of sin. Now we can have disagreements. I, I mentioned earlier, our consciences are different. But when it comes to sin, we're all on the same, we're all on the same level here. We have to be patient, compassionate, and honest. One of the words that you see in the New Testament sometimes is forbearance. We need to forbear with one another. Ephesians 4 uses that term. Forbearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. But let's, let's close with this thought here. I want us to go back to our Scripture reading. So take it back to Luke chapter 17. And here's what we need to understand about this subject. And this is where the discussion often goes off the rails in Bible classes and questions and answers is, well, what if they don't ask for forgiveness? So there's your question. Well, if a person's not willing to ask for forgiveness, that means they, that they haven't repented. Because when you repent, you change your mind. Metanoia, it's what the word is in the original, and it means a change of mind. And so, look at Luke 17 again. It is impossible, but that offenses will come. We are human. We are going to offend people. We're going to sin against people. People are going to sin against us. But woe unto him through whom they come. That's the warning. Look at verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. <clears throat> if thy brother trespass against thee, sin against thee, he has violated God's revealed will. What do you do? Just give it time. Ignore it. Go talk to somebody else about it. I like this one. Go talk to the preacher. Go talk to the elders. No. You will never find that stipulation in Scripture. But we have abused that hierarchical structure in the church to avoid the confrontations that we don't want to have. I'll go talk to the preacher. I'll go talk to the elders. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. Rebuke. We're going to talk about that word tonight in the lesson because that's part of preaching. Rebuke means to show where a person is wrong. If a person sins against you, you show them where they are wrong. And if he changes his mind, repents, forgive him. What does that word uh, forgive mean again? You send it away. It's done. If he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Now let me ask you a question here. Forgiveness is the obligation. Do I have to maintain the same type of relationship with that person if they constantly are doing the same thing? I don't think the Bible teaches that. But it does teach that if a person truly repents, you have to forgive them. And the relationship still might change a little bit, but you still have to forgive them. You don't hold them in probation and say, I'm just going to wait and see what happens next. You try to move on, you do the best you can. Sometimes, again, that's why I mentioned Romans 12, 18 earlier. Sometimes people don't want to move on. They want to hold to that and, and hold it over your head forever. Seven times. You see that in Matthew 18. You see it in Luke chapter 17. There's, there has to be pity, uh, patience, and compassion. There has to be honesty and acknowledgement, specificity. There has to be that confrontation. But you and I cannot do more than God. If a person is not willing to change, you cannot forgive them. Period. Now, that doesn't mean you hold a grudge and you hate that person and you then now you start gossiping about them to everybody else and destroying them behind their back because that's what happens a lot of times. Can't do that. 
but you can't do more than God does. Let me ask you a question. If you want forgiveness of sins from God, is that unconditional? Are you unconditionally forgiven by God? Do you have to do anything? Well, of course you do. You, you have to repent of your sin. If you're a person who's never been baptized into Christ, you have to, it's, it's baptism that washes away sins, Acts 22, 16. But for some reason, we think that we as humans can do better at forgiving than God can. I'm not going to put any stick. He, does, you know, he doesn't have to do anything. It's okay. And we're better than God is at this. It's kind of interesting to think about, isn't it? We want reconciliation. We, want, we need reconciliation and forgiveness. Because again, if a sin has been committed and I'm not willing to repent of it against you, I'm not right with you. And as such, I'm not right with God. Forgiveness is, there's a lot to it. And it can be, the way we handle it sometimes, let's say, can be messy. But the Bible lays it out very clearly. This is, this is how you do it. And it's, in fact, it's so clear, Jesus literally gives it to us step by step. Here's step one, step two, step three. And there are other passages throughout your New Testament that address this. But every one of us needs human forgiveness and we need divine forgiveness. But we have to meet the proper terms for that to happen. Again, whether it's human to human or divine to human. Are you forgiven of your sins this morning? You see, if you're in Christ, if you're a person who has placed your faith in Christ, you have read His Word, you know what He's done for you, you know who He is as the Son of God, and you know who you are and your need for forgiveness, you can have that. But it's on His terms. You have to repent. You have to believe. You have to, you have to be baptized into Christ. Again, the initial process, there's no praying for forgiveness before you obey the gospel. You have to have your sins washed away in baptism. Now, let's say you've done that. You have put Christ on in baptism. You're now a child of God who's walking in the light. You're still going to sin. You're still going to offend someone. You're still going to be offended. What do you do then? Well, there are, there are steps. I don't particularly like that word, but... There are things that must be done in order to obtain forgiveness. If you're a Christian who has sin in your life, you've got to repent and pray for forgiveness. That's Acts 8, verses 18 through 22. And if somebody's here this morning who needs that forgiveness, maybe it's, maybe it's something that nobody else knows about, but you're sitting in this auditorium with someone, you better take care of it that way. Because you can't be right with God until you do. Maybe it's something of a public nature. Scripture teaches us about that too. Repent and pray. We'll pray for you. So if there's any need to respond to the gospel this morning to be forgiven, let's do it right now as we stand and sing.